Good evening. I'm Carolyn Waters, head librarian of the New York Society Library, one of the first libraries in the country and the oldest in New York City. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this second program in our Black Literature Matters program, a program of dramatic readings written by African Americans during the 1800s. Before we get to the writers, however, a note about the New York Society Library in the 1800s. The New York Society Library started the 19th century in its second location on 33 Nassau Street. But having combined with the New York Athenaeum, a literary and scientific club, we needed more space and uh, moved to Broadway and Leonard Streets. The new building housed a large lecture hall, which was used for entertainments, discussions, and assemblies. And as we shall learn, attracted a number of luminaries, including quite possibly Frederick Douglass. It was also at this time that the library expanded access to those who were not shareholders. Temporary subscribers could use the library by paying an annual fee of $10, $6 for six months, or $4 for three months. As a private institution that predates the taxpayer-supported public library system, members then and now need to pay a fee to join the library. So while a lack of funds could have been uh, a barrier to access, it's clear from our archives, however, that one's gender or race was not. In the 1700s, we see the names of at least 57 women members in our charging ledger and one woman signed our charter. In the 1800s, we know of at least one African-American member, and by delving a little bit more into our archives, we hope to be able to discover there were more. In 1856, Jeremiah G. Hamilton purchased a library share and began using the library, which at that point had moved to University Place. We know from our charging ledgers that Hamilton checked out nearly 260 books until his death in 1875. According to his biographer, Shane White, Hamilton was Wall Street's first black millionaire. Our last program showed that in the 1700s, black writers were enslaved. We listened to, to, we listened to passages by five black writers of the 1700s, learning that less than a dozen published black works of that century still exist. This program will focus on the 1800s, for which the work of many, many Black writers, men and increasingly women, survives. In newspapers, pamphlets, broadsides, and books, these writers address a widespread reading public on slavery, suffrage, literacy, and the issues of the day. Slavery continued until the 1860s, the Civil War and Reconstruction, followed by post-Reconstruction. Our program will introduce Black writers of the 1800s in a roughly chronological framework. Joining me again on the program is Dr. Farah Griffin from Columbia University. Dr. Griffin is the inaugural chair of the African American and African Diaspora Studies Department at Columbia, where she is also professor of English and comparative literature. Hi, Farah. Hi, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. So pleased to join you this evening as we continue our exploration of black writing. Works from the 1700s, which we explored last time, were largely narratives and poetry addressed to white audiences. Uh, and they often sought to prove that blacks were human. Nonetheless, writers like Jupiter Hammond clearly read Phyllis Wheatley and Equiano and other black writers also read each other. In the 1800s, we still have slave narratives and poetry, uh, but we are joined, those, those genres are joined by other forms, um, a different take on the slave narrative. Uh, more and more black women are writing. Poetry remains plentiful as well. We also get diverse genres, manifestos, short stories and novels. Antebellum slave narratives were still addressed primarily to white audiences, 
literacy became a pathway to freedom for the enslaved. But some of the manifestos, poems, and fiction, and other writings were actually published in Black publications meant for Black audiences. Tonight, we'll hear work by David Walker, Henry Highland Garnett, and Harriet Wilson, all of whom imagined audiences that were Black, while Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs were most often writing for white audiences, though primarily abolitionists. An increasingly militant abolitionist program grew larger in the first half of the 1800s. The white allies supported the founding of schools in northern black communities, and blacks saw university ticket to freedom. Whites continued to provide a readership for black writers, although blacks were also reading black writers. The abolition le lecture circuit was important for black literature because these gatherings gave rise to writing by black authors that was then distributed in print by schools and literary societies in the North. Before the Civil War, the New York Society Library collections included works by anti-slavery and abolitionist writers, such as Benjamin Franklin's 1789 Address to the Public from the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage, which was acquired by the library in 1841. A Struggle of the History for Slavery Extension or Restriction by Horace Greeley, who was most likely a library member. Benjamin Lundy's Genius of Universal Emancipation, which was added to the library's collection sometime between its publication in 1831 and 1838. Charles Sumner's recent speeches, which were published by the abolitionist senator who was beaten nearly to death on May 22, 1856, in the United States Senate chamber by a so Southern pro-late pro-slavery senator in retaliation for the speech Sumner had given two days earlier, fiercely criticizing slaveholders. The library acquired the speeches within a year of its 1856 publication. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, considered one of the most influential novels ever written and which was checked out twice in the six months before February, 1860. Slavery was gradually abolished in New York City, finally ending July 4, 1827, by which date the library was located at Nassau Street. Members would read in the newspapers about the 1829 three-day riot in Cincinnati, where whites attacked blacks and burned their homes. But they probably did not read the writing of freeborn David Walker, recognized for his anti-slavery speeches. A self-avowed restless disturber of the peace, he published in 1829 The Appeal, a powerful call to action by the enslaved. My dearly beloved brethren and fellow citizens, having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States and having, in the course of my travels, taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of these United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject sect of human beings that ever lived since the world began. Let no man of us budge one step and let slaveholders come to beat us from our country. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. The greatest riches in all America have arisen from our blood and tears. And will they drive us from our property and homes, which we have earned with our blood? They must look sharp, or this very thing will bring swift destruction upon them. The Americans have got so fat on our blood and groans that they have almost forgotten the god of armies. But let them go on. See your declarations, Americans. Do you understand your own language? Hear your languages proclaimed to the world July 4th, 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, 
that they are endowed by their creator with its certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Compare your own language above, extracted from your Declaration of Independence, with your cruelties and murders inflicted by your cruel and unmerciful fathers and yourselves on our fathers and on us, men who have never given your fathers or you the least provocation. Walker's self-published manifesto was found as far south as Charleston, New Orleans, and Savannah, where black soldiers smuggled, sailors smuggled it. It was sewn into the linings of their coats. They secretly shared it with free black communities there. It is even believed that the appeal was clandestinely read aloud in the slave community as well. Blacks were arrested for distributing the pamphlet. Authorities in Savannah even instituted a Negro Seamen Act, which mandated the incarceration of all black seamen while their ships were in port. After reading Dade Walker's appeal, Maria W. Stewart on September 21st, 1832, was inspired to address what was then called a promiscuous audience. That is an audience of men as well as women. This was the regular monthly meeting in Boston of the New England Anti-Slavery Society that William Lloyd Garrison had, phone, had founded in January. Why sit ye here and die? If we say we will go to a foreign land, the famine and the pestilence are there, and there we shall die. If we sit here, we shall die. Come, let us plead our cause before the whites. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Did the pilgrims, when they first landed on these shores, quietly compose themselves and say, the Britons have all the money and all the power and we must continue their servants forever? Hmm. Did they sluggishly sigh and say, our lot is hard. The Indians own the soil and we cannot cultivate it? No. They first made powerful efforts to raise themselves. Oh, and then God raised up those illustrious patriots, Washington and Lafayette, to assist and defend them. And my brethren, have you made a powerful effort? Have you prayed the legislature for mercy's sake to grant you all the rights and privileges of free citizens? That your daughters may rise to that degree of respectability which true merit deserves, and your sons above the servile situations which most of them fill? Hmm? Frederick Douglass is believed to have visited the New York Society Library in 1850. The American Anti-Slavery Society scheduled its 16th annual meeting for May 7th at the Broadway Tabernacle and on May 8th in the library's auditorium. We know that Douglass was one of the speakers who were shouted down by Isaiah Captain Rinders and his angry mob on the 7th. When the mob appeared again on the 8th in the library's auditorium and continued its efforts to disrupt the proceedings, the Anti-Slavery Society canceled the rest of the day's program and moved its meeting to the library's private conversation rooms. While we don't have undeniable proof that Douglas attended that second day of meetings in the library, it seems very likely that he was probably there. His life, 1818 to 1895, spanned much of the century. He was born enslaved, seized his freedom, and addressed his people's enslavement and emancipation through three autobiographies, as well as oratory, letters, newspaper articles, poetry, and one short story. He wrote his most vivid account of learning to read in Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, written by himself, published in 1881. At age eight, 
young Frederick was sent to work in the Baltimore household of Hugh and Sophia Odd as a body servant to their son, Thomas. The frequent hearing of my mistress reading the Bible aloud, for she often read aloud when her husband wasn't absent, awakened my curiosity and respect to this mystery of reading and roused in me the desire to learn. Now, up to this time, I had known nothing whatever of this wonderful art, and my ignorance and inexperience of what it could do for me, as well as my confidence in my mistress, emboldened me to ask her to teach me to read. With an unconsciousness and an inexperience equal to my own, she readily consented, and in an incredibly short time, by her kind assistance, I had mastered the alphabet and could spell words of three or four letters. Now, my mistress seemed almost as proud of my progress as if I had been her own child, and supposing that her husband would be as well pleased, she made no secret of what she was doing for me. Oh, indeed, she exultantly told him of the aptness of her pupil and of her intention to persevere as she felt it in her duty to do in teaching me at least to read the Bible. And here rose the first dark cloud over my Baltimore prospects, the precursor of chilling blasts and drenching storms. Master Hugh was astounded beyond measure and probably for the first time proceeded to unfold to his wife the true philosophy of the slave system and the peculiar rules necessary in the nature of the case to be observed in the management of human chattels. Now, of course, he forbade her to give me any further instruction, telling her in the first place that to do so was unlawful, and it was also unsafe. For, said he, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. Learning will spoil the best nigger in the world. If he learns to read the Bible, it will forever unfit him to be a slave. He should know nothing but the will of his master and learn to obey it. As to himself, learning will do him no good, but a great deal of harm, making him disconsolate and unhappy. Now, if you teach him how to read, he'll want to know how to write. And this accomplished, he'll be running away with himself. This was a new and special revelation, dispelling a painful mystery against which my youthful understanding had struggled and struggled in vain to wit the white man's power to perpetuate the enslavement of the black man. Very well, thought I. Knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. I instinctively assented to the proposition. And from that moment, I understood the direct pathway from slavery to freedom. In what point in his life, Douglas, in my bondage and my freedom, recalled his 16-year-old self, driven to desperation, fighting Edward Covey, who had a reputation as a slave breaker. The fighting madness had come upon me, and I found my strong fingers firmly attached to the throat of my cowardly tormentor, as heedless of consequences at the moment as though we stood as equals before the law. The very color of the man was forgotten, I felt as supple as a cat and was ready for the snakish creature at every turn. Now, every blow of his was parry. Though I dealt no blows in turn, I was strictly on the defensive, preventing him from injuring me rather than trying to injure him. I flung him on the ground several times when he meant to have hurled me there. I held him so firmly by the throat that his blood followed my nails. He held me and I held him. Well, my dear reader, this battle with Mr. Covey, undignified as it was, and as I fear my narration of it is, was the turning point in my life as a slave. It rekindled in my breast the smoldering embers of liberty. It brought up my Baltimore dreams and revived a sense of my own manhood. I was a changed being after that fight. I was nothing before. I was a man now. It recalled to, to life my crushed self-respect and my self-confidence and inspired me with a renewed determination to be a free man, a man without 
force is without the essential dignity of humanity. Human nature is so constituted that it cannot honor a helpless man, although it can pity him. And even this, it cannot do long if the signs of power do not arise. While Douglas was the towering black public figure and writer of his time, he was not the only one to produce powerful and influential narratives. Solomon Northrup's 12 Years a Slave, published in 1853, documents his own harrowing tale of having been kidnapped and sold into slavery to a Louisiana plantation where he spent 12 years in bondage. Prior to his kidnapping, Northrup, born free and well-educated, had been living with his family on a farm in upstate New York. Literary historian William Andrews notes that 12 years a slave, quote, struck the United States like a literary thunderbolt. Here, Northrop describes the torment of a fellow slave in Louisiana, Patsy. Patsy had a genial and pleasant temper and was faithful and obedient. Uh, naturally, she was a joyous creature, a laughing, light-hearted girl, rejoicing in the mere sense of existence. Yet, Patsy wept oftener and suffered more than any of her companions. She had been literally excoriated. Her back bore the scars of a thousand stripes. And not, not because she was backward in her work, nor because she was of an unmindful and rebellious spirit, but because it had fallen to her lot to be the slave of a licentious master, Mr. Edwin Epps, and a jealous mistress, Mrs. Mary Epps. She sh shrank before the lustful eye of the one and was in danger even of her life at the hands of the other. And between the two, she was indeed accursed. Well, Patsy was late to work one day and Epps, muttering fiercely through clenched teeth, vowed to take the starch out of her. Then turning to me, he ordered four stakes to be driven into the ground, pointing with the toe of his boot to the places where he wanted them. And when the stakes were driven down, he ordered her to be stripped of every article of dress. The ropes were then brought and the naked girl was laid upon her face, her wrists and feet each tied firmly to a stake. And by the time her back was covered with long welts intersecting each other like network, Epps was yet furious and savage as ever, swearing he would flog her until she wished she was in hell. She was terribly lacerated. And I may say without exaggeration, literally flayed. The lash was wet with blood, which flowed down her sides and dropped upon the ground. And at length she ceased struggling. Her head sank listlessly on the ground. If ever there was a broken heart, one crushed and blighted by the rude grasp of suffering misfortune, it was Patsy's. Harriet Jacobs' testimony was the first narrative published by a Black woman in the United States. Her incidents in the life of a slave girl reveals the sexual abuse and trauma that was a cruelty of slavery. And this narrative sought to organize Northern white women to join in the fight against the institution. My master began to whisper foul words in my ear. Young as I was, I could not remain ignorant of their import. I tried to treat them with indifference or contempt. The master's age, my extreme youth, and the fear that his conduct would be reported to my grandmother made him bear this treatment for many months. Hmm. Oh, he was a crafty man and resorted to many means to accomplish his purposes. Sometimes he had stormy, terrific ways that made his victims tremble. Sometimes he assumed a gentleness that he thought must surely subdue. Of the two, 
I preferred his stormy moods, although they left me trembling. He tried his utmost to corrupt the pure principles my grandmother had instilled. He peopled my young mind with unclean images, such as only a vile monster could think of. I turned from him with disgust and hatred, but he was my master. I was compelled to live under the same roof with him, where I saw a man, 40 years my senior, daily violating the most sacred commandments of nature. He told me I was his property, that I must be subject to his will in all things. My soul revolted against the mean tyranny, but where could I turn for protection? No matter whether the slave girl be as black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, in either case, there is no shadow of law to protect her from insult, from violence, or even from death. All these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. The mistress who ought to protect the helpless victim has no other feelings towards her but those of jealousy and rage. The degradation, the wrongs, the vices that grow out of slavery are more than I can describe. I once saw two beautiful children playing together. One was a fair white child the other was a, her slave and also her sister. When I saw them embracing each other and heard their joyous laughter, I turned sadly away from the lovely sight. I foresaw the inevitable blight that would befall on the little slave's heart. I knew how soon her laughter would be changed to sighs. The fair child grew up to be a still fair woman. From childhood to womanhood, her pathway was blooming with flowers and overarched by a sunny sky. Scarcely one day of her life had been clouded when the sun rose on her happy bridal morning. How had those years dealt with her slave sister, the little playmate of her childhood? She also was very beautiful. But the flowers and sunshine of love were not for her. Mm. She drank from the cup of sin and shame and misery, whereof her persecuted race are compelled to drink. In view of these things, why are ye silent, ye free men and women of the North? Why do your tongues falter in maintenance of the right? Oh. Would I had more ability? But my heart is so full and my pen is so weak. There are noble men and women who plead for us, striving to help those who cannot help themselves. Oh, God bless them. God bless, give them the strength and courage to go on. God bless those everywhere who are laboring to advance the cause of humanity. Less known are the 14 manuscripts written in Arabic by Omar Ibn Said, an educated Muslim African born about 1770 in Futatoro which is not modern Senegal, captured and brought to South Carolina in 1801. Perhaps 10% of the enslaved Africans transported to the Americas were Muslim. His 1831 autobiographical essay, written in Arabic and translated into English, began with memorized passages from the Quran and included Muslim prayers and texts. Before I came to the Christian country, my religion was the religion of Muhammad, the apostle of God. May God have mercy upon him and give him peace. I walk to mosque before daybreak, wash my face and head and hands and feet. I prayed at noon, prayed in the afternoon, prayed at sunset, and prayed in the evening. 
I gave alms every year, gold, silver, seeds, cattle, sheep, goats, rice, wheat, and barley. I gave tithes of all the above named things. I went every year to the holy war against the infidels. I went on pilgrimage to Mecca, as all did who were able. My father had six sons and five daughters, and my mother had three sons and one daughter. When I left my country, I was 37 years old. I have been in the country of the Christians 24 years. Written 1831 AD. I reside in this our country by reason of great necessity. Wicked men took me by violence and sold me to the Christians. We sailed a month and a half on the great sea to the place called Charleston in the Christian land. I fell into the hands of a small, weak and wicked man who feared not God at all, nor did he read the gospel at all, nor pray. I was afraid to remain with a man so depraved and who committed so many crimes, and I ran away. The slave narrative genre influenced a myriad of forms used by black writers. For instance, William Wells Brown published the narrative of William W. Brown, a fugitive slave, written by himself in 1847. He also wrote travel accounts and plays, but most notably, he wrote the first novel by an African-American, Clotel, or The President's Daughter, a narrative of a slave life in the United States which was published in London in 1853. Clotel is the fictional account of the mixed race daughters and granddaughters of President Thomas Jefferson. There are in the District of Columbia several slave prisons or Negro pens as they are termed. These prisons are mostly occupied by persons to keep their slaves in when collecting their gangs together for the New Orleans market. By order of her master, Clotel was removed from Richmond and placed in one of these prisons to await the sailing of a vessel for New Orleans. At the dusk of the evening previous to the day when she was to be sent off, as the old prison was being closed for the night, she suddenly darted past her keeper and ran for her life. It is not a great distance from the prison to the Long Bridge, which passes from the lower part of the city across the Potomac to the extensive forests and woodlands of the celebrated Arlington Place. On either hand, far down below, rolled the deep foamy waters of the Potomac, and before and behind the rapidly approaching step and noisy voices of pursuers. She clasped her hands convulsively and raised them as she at the time raised her eyes towards heaven and begged for that mercy and compassion there, which had been denied her on earth. And then with a single bound, she vaulted over the railings of the bridge and sunk forever beneath the waves of the river. Thus died Clotel, the daughter of Thomas Jefferson, a president of the United States, a man distinguished as the author of the Declaration of American Independence and one of the first statesmen of that country. Had Clotel escaped from oppression in any other land, in the disguise in which she fled from the Mississippi to Richmond and reached the United States, no honor within the gift of the American people would have been too good to have been heaped upon the heroic woman. But she was a slave and therefore out of the pale of their sympathy. We are still discovering novels written by African-Americans. Many of those were first serialized in black publications. New Englander Harriet Wilson published Our Nig, Sketches from the Life of a Free Black in 1859. 
This fictionalized autobiography in place works a work of satire um, sought to demonstrate the harsh lives of Northern free blacks. It is the story of Fredo, a young indentured servant. This excerpt is from a scene where she finally stands up for herself, finds her voice and her confidence. Fredo was sent for wood and not returning as soon as Mrs. B calculated, she followed her and snatching from the pile of a stick, raised it over her. Stop, shouted Fredo. Strike me and I'll never work a mite more for you. And throwing down what she had gathered, stood like one who feels the stirring of free and independent thoughts. By this unexpected demonstration, her mistress in amazement dropped her weapon, desisting from her purpose of chastisement. Fredo walked towards the house, her mistress following with the wood she herself was sent after. She did not know before that she had a power to ward off assaults. Her triumph in seeing her enter the door with her burden repaid her for much of her former suffering. It was characteristic of Mrs. B never to rise in her majesty unless she was sure she should be victorious. This affair never met with an afterclap like many others. She remembered her victory at the wood pile. She decided to remain to do as well as she could to assert her rights when they were trampled on, to return once more to her meeting in the evening, which had been prohibited. She had learned to conquer. The legendary Howard University librarian, Dorothy Porter, first discovered Hannah Craft's novel, The Bond Woman's Narrative, in 1948. But it wasn't authenticated as a Black authored text until 2001 by scholar Henry Louis Gates, who helped to bring it to the attention of contemporary audiences. In this brief excerpt, the white enslaver's dour face is embarrassingly blackened by a supposedly beautifying powder. Mrs. Wheeler conceived her beauty to be on the wane. She had been a belle in youth and the thought of her fading charms was unendurable. Some great Italian chemist uh, had discovered or, or rather invented an impalpable powder, fine, highly scented and luxurious that applied to the hands and face was said to produce the most marvelous effect. I was summoned and directed to go at once to the chemist and get a box of the Italian medicated powder. The powder was very fine, soft and white, and certainly did add much to the beauty of her appearance. The next moment I heard my voice called and turning round beheld Mrs. Wheeler. I, I was greatly surprised, for though the veil, the bonnet, and the dress were those of that lady or, or exactly similar, the face was black. I stood gazing in mute amazement when a voice not in the least languid called out, what are you gazing at me in that manner for? Am I to be insulted by my own slaves? Mr. Wheeler, sobbing with surprised laughter, <laughs> exclaimed, Why, madam, I, I didn't know you. Your face is black. Black, said the lady. Hannah, bring the mirror. I complied. She gazed a moment, and then her mingled emotions of grief Rage and shame who were truly awful. Listening to novels and narratives from the 1850s, but as early as the 1840s, the abolitionist movement was growing increasingly radical. One of its most powerful voices was Henry Highland Garnett, born into slavery in Maryland in 1815. At the age of 10, Garnett escaped with his mother and his siblings with the assistance of a group of Quakers. They escaped to New York. 
Educated in that city's African free school, he eventually moved to Troy, New York, where he became pastor of the Liberty Street Presbyterian Church and founded an abolitionist newspaper. Upon returning to New York City, he joined the American Anti-Slavery Society and became a well-known speaker on the abolitionist circuit. Garnett delivered an address to the slaves of the United States of America before the National Convention of Colored Citizens in Buffalo, New York on August 16, 1843. He would later publish it along with David Walker's appeal in 1848, thus aligning his statement with that of the early, earlier figure. The address is told from the perspective of an activist free black community who have organized against slavery. Brethren and fellow citizens, your brethren of the North, East and West have been accustomed to meet together in national conventions, to sympathize with each other and to weep over your unhappy condition. In these meetings, we have addressed all classes of the free, but we have never until this time sent a word of consolation and advice to you. Now, while you have been oppressed, we have also been partakers with you, nor can we be free while you are enslaved. We, therefore, write to you as being bound with you. Now, many of you are bound to us not only by the ties of a common humanity, but we are connected by the more tender relations of parents, wives, husbands, children, brothers and sisters and friends. As such, we most affectionately address you. Brethren, arise, arise, strike for your lives and liberties. Now is the day and the hour. Let every slave throughout the land do this, and the days of slavery are numbered. You cannot be more oppressed than you have been. You cannot suffer greater cruelties than you have already. Rather die free men than live to be slaves. Remember that you are four millions. Let your motto be resistance. Resistance, resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance. What kind of resistance you had better make, you must decide by your circumstances that surround you and according to the suggestion of expediency. Brethren, adieu. Trust in the living God, labor for the peace of the human race, and remember that you are four millions. In 1854, Martin Delaney at the National Emigration Convention in Cleveland delivered his second manifesto, considered to be the foundation of black nationalism. No people can be free who themselves do not constitute an essential part of the ruling element of the country in which they live. The liberty of no man is secure who controls not his own political destiny. A people to be free must necessarily be their own rulers. Now the great issue, sooner or later, upon which must be disputed the world's destiny will be a question of black and white and every individual will be called upon for his identity with one or the other. James Whitfield was a friend of Martin Delaney, and like Delaney, called for African-American immigration. Here is an excerpt from his 160-line poem, America, which celebrated Black nationalism. America, it is to thee, thou boasted land of liberty. It is to thee I raise my song, thou land of blood and crime and wrong. It is to thee, my native land, from whence has issued many a band to tear the black man from his soil and force him here to delve and toil. Chained on your blood, be moistened sod, cringing beneath a tyrant's rod. Stripped of those rights which nature's God 
bequeathed to all the human race, bound to a petty tyrant's nod. Because he wears a paler face, was it for this that freedom's fires were kindled by your patriot sires? The United States included 33 states and 10 territories. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in November of that year and issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. The Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, declaring all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to, to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Charlotte Horton Grimke spent two years teaching on St. Helena Island, South Carolina from 1862 to 1864. At her death in 1914, she left five volumes of diaries written between 1854 and 1864 and between 1885 and 1892 and published, and published posthumously. They would give a unique and intimate portrait of the life of a free black female in the antebellum North during the Civil War and thereafter. which was held by Union troops. She recorded her experiences teaching those who were formerly enslaved or had escaped during the war. She set down their hymns and what she called their shouts. In an entry for December 14, 1862, she made one of the earliest recorded references to the blues as a sad or depressed state of mind. She had come home from a church service with the blues because she felt very lonesome and pitied myself. She soon got over her sadness and later noted certain songs, including one called Poor Rosie, popular among the slaves. She felt she could not adequately describe the manner of singing, but said the songs, I quote, can't be sung without a full heart and a troubled spirit. Those conditions inspired countless blues songs and could be described as the essence of blues singing. From Life in the Sea Islands, May 1864, The Atlantic Monthly. It was nearly dark when we reached the island of St. Helena, and then we had a three miles drive through the lonely roads to the house of the superintendent. After breakfast, Miss T drove us to Oakland's, our future home. The road leading to the house was nearly choked with weeds, the house itself was in a dilapidated condition and the yard and garden had a sadly neglected look. But there were roses in bloom. We plucked handfuls of feathery fragrant acacia bloom blossoms. Ivy crept along the ground and under the house. The freed people on the place seemed glad to see us. After talking with them and giving some directions for cleaning the house, we drove to the school in which I was to teach. It is kept in the Baptist church, a brick building beautifully situated in a grove of live oaks. These trees are the first objects that attract one's attention here. And not that they are finer than our northern oaks, but because of the singular gray moss with which every branch is heavily draped. This hanging moss grows on nearly all the trees, but on none so luxuriantly as on the live oak. The pendants are often four or five feet long, very graceful and beautiful, but giving the trees a solemn, almost funereal look. The school was opened in September. Many of the children had, however, received instruction during the summer. 
It was evident that they had made very rapid improvement, and we noticed with pleasure how bright and eager to learn many of them seemed. They sang in rich, sweet tones, and with a peculiar swaying motion of the body, which made their singing the more effective. They sang marching along with great spirit, and then one of their own hymns, the air of which is beautiful and touching. My sister, you want to get religion? Go down in the lonesome valley. My brother, you want to get religion? Go down in the lonesome valley. Go down in the lonesome valley. Oh, go down in the lonesome valley, my Lord. Go down in the lonesome valley to meet my Jesus there. They repeat their hymns several times, and while singing, keep perfect time with their hands and feet. Notwithstanding the heat, we determined to celebrate the 4th of July as worthily as we could. The freed people and the children of the different schools assembled in the grove near the Baptist church. The flag was hung across the road between two magnificent live oaks, and the children, being grouped under it, sang the Star Spangled Banner with much spirit. Then the people sang some of their own hymns, and the woods resounded with the grand notes of Roll, Jordan, Roll. They all afterward partook of refreshments consisting of molasses and water a very great luxury to them and hard tack. For decades, the most influential figure of the later 19th century and early 20th century was the indomitable Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was born in Franklin County, Virginia in what was quote, the most miserable, desolate and discouraging surroundings. He never knew his white father and was raised by his enslaved mother, Jane. After the Civil War and emancipation, the family moved to West Virginia to work in the salt furnaces and the coal mines where he first attended school. In his autobiography, Up From Slavery, The Struggle for an Education, he writes. One day while at work in the coal mine, I happened to overhear two miners talking about a great school for colored people somewhere in Virginia. Now in the darkness of the mine, I noiselessly crept as close as I could to the two men who were talking. I heard one tell the other that not only was the school established for the members of any race, but the opportunities that it provided by which poor but worthy students could work out all or a part of the cost of a board and at the same time be taught some trade or industry. Well, I resolved at once to go to that school, although I had no idea where it was or how many miles away or how I was gonna reach it. I remembered only that I was on fire constantly with one ambition and that was to go to Hampton. This thought was with me day and night. In 1872, at age 17, Washington embarked on an arduous 500-mile journey to seek admission to Hampton Institute, 
an industrial school for Blacks and Native Americans in Virginia, to which he was accepted. After graduating with honors and serving on the faculty, he was asked to lead the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in Alabama. From July 4th, 1881, its official opening until his death in 1915, Washington concentrated on maintaining Tuskegee as a major black run educational institution. The keynotes, industrial education, and an emphasis on pride, solidarity, and self-help. The historian Rayford Logan termed the period following the end of Reconstruction in 1877 as the nadir, or the lowest point of African American history. Characterized by rampant racial terrorism, the institutionalization of racial segregation in every aspect of American life, and thoroughgoing disenfranchisement of Black voters. The period also gave birth to a burst of writing by Black Americans who sought to use the power of the pen to challenge racial oppression. Poet, orator, abolitionist, feminist, and novelist, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was the most well-known Black woman of the 19th century. She developed a genre of protest poetry with her 1854 collection, Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects. Here are stanzas from her poem, The Slave Mother. Heard you that shriek? Whew. It rose so wildly on the air. It seemed as if a burdened heart was breaking in despair. They tear him from her circling arms, her last and fond embrace, oh. Nevermore may her sad eyes gaze on his mournful face. No marvel then these bitter shrieks disturb the listening air. She is a mother and her heart is breaking in despair. Harper's short story, The Two Offers, was published in the Anglo-African in 1859, making literary history as the first short story published by a Black woman. Immediately following the Civil War in May 1866, Frances Harper spoke at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention. We are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. This grand and glorious revolution which has commenced will fail to reach its climax of success until throughout the length and breadth of the American Republic, the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. It will then have no privileged class, trampling upon and outraging the unprivileged classes, but will then be one great privileged nation whose privilege will be to produce the loftiest manhood and womanhood that humanity can attain. Harper's first novel, Iola Leroy, or Shadows Uplifted, which was published in 1892, depicts a slave family's effort to reunite after emancipation, a work to chronicle the Reconstruction South from an African-American point of view. Tom was very anxious to get word to the beautiful but intractable girl who was held in durance vile by her reckless and selfish master who had tried in vain to drag her down to his own low level of sin and shame. The field hospital was needing gentle, womanly ministrations, and Iola Leroy, released from the hands of her tormentors, was given a place as nurse, a position to which she adapted herself with a deep sense of relief. 
Now, Tom was doubly gratified at the success of his endeavors, which had resulted in the rescue of the beautiful young girl and the discomfiture of his young master, who, in the words of Tom, was mad enough to bite his head off. <laughs> a rather difficult physical feat. Well, Tom Anderson was a man of Herculean strength and remarkable courage. But on account of physical defects, instead of enlisting as a soldier, he was forced to remain a servant, although he felt as if every nerve in his right arm was tingling to strike a blow for freedom. He was ever ready and willing to serve anywhere at any time and to gather information from every possible source which could be of any service to the Union Army. As a pagan might worship a distant star and wish to call it his own, so he loved Iola. And he never thought he could do too much for the soldiers who had rescued her and were bringing deliverance to his race. Pauline E. Hopkins is considered a pioneer in her use of the romantic novel to explore social and racial themes. She quotes in Contending Forces, published in 1890, fiction is of great value to any people as a preserver of manners and customs, religious, political, and social. It is a record of growth and development from generation to generation. She is said to have authored the first murder mystery written by an African-American, published by the Colored American Magazine in 1900. During the latter decades of the century, Black writers began to write works of even greater literary sophistication. Nowhere is this more evident than in the ambitious stories and novels of Charles Chestnut, many published serially in the Atlantic Monthly and exploring complex issues of racial and social identity in the post-Civil War South. In 1899, two collections of short stories, The Conjure Woman, and The Wife of His Youth and Other Stories of the Color Line were published. This from The Wife of His Youth. Suppose that this husband, soon after his escape, had learned that his wife had been sold away and that such inquiries as he could make brought no information of her whereabouts. Suppose that he was young and she much older than he, that he was light and she was black, that their marriage was a slave marriage and legally binding only if they chose to make it so after the war. Suppose, too, that he made his way to the North, as some of us have done, and there where he had larger opportunities, had improved them, and had in the course of all these years grown to be as different from the ignorant boy who ran away from fear of slavery as the day is from the night. And then, Suppose that accident should bring to his knowledge the fact that his wife of his youth, the wife he had left behind him, not one who had walked by his side and kept pace with him in this upward struggle, but one upon whom advancing years and a laborious life had set their mark, was alive and seeking him, but that he was absolutely safe from recognition or discovery unless he chose to reveal himself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, friends and companions, I ask you, what should he have done? Yes, they all echoed, he should have acknowledged her. He turned and walked toward the closed door of an adjoining room while every eye followed him in wondering curiosity. He came back in a moment, leading by the hand his visitor of the afternoon, who stood startled and trembling at the sudden plunge into the scene of brilliant gaiety. She was neatly dressed in gray and wore the white cap of an elderly woman. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, this is the woman, and I am the man whose story I have told you. Permit me to introduce to you the wife of my youth. During this period, black poetry begins to take center stage as well, particularly the works of a young poet 
Paul Lawrence Dunbar, one of the most influential poets in all of American poetry. Dunbar's wife, Alice Dunbar Nelson, was also a significant poet of the time. I sit and sew, a useless task it seems. My hands grown tired, my head weighed down with dreams. The panoply of war, the martial tread of men, grim face, stern eyes, gazing beyond the kin of lesser souls, whose eyes have not seen death, nor learned to hold their lives but as a breath. But I must sit and sew. The little useless scene, the idle patch, why dream I here beneath my homely thatch when there they lie in sodden mud and rain, pitifully calling me, the quick ones and the slain? You need me, Christ. It is no roseate dream that beckons me, this pretty futile scene. Oh, it stifles me. God, must I sit and sew? from Paul Lawrence Dunbar's We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay. Let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the, dream, the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. from sympathy. I know why the cage bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings. Ida B. Wells began her public speaking career on October 5th, 1892 in New York City, where she spoke to 250 African-American women about her experiences dealing with the lynch law. Soon she published Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases, a pamphlet describing the realities of African-Americans in the Reconstruction South. Of the many inhuman outrages of this present year, the only case where the proposed lynching did not occur was where the men armed themselves in Jacksonville, Florida and Paducah, Kentucky and prevented it. The only times an Afro-American who was assaulted got away has been when he had a gun and used it in self-defense. The lesson this teaches, and which every Afro-American should ponder well, is that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every Black home, and it should be used for that protection which the law refuses to give. When the white man, who is always the aggressor, knows he runs as great risk of biting the dust every time his Afro-American victim does, he will have greater respect for Afro-American life. January 1900, in a speech on lynch law in Chicago, Wells called it the country's national crime. Our country's national crime is lynching. It is not the creature of an hour 
the sudden outburst of uncontrolled fury, or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. Hmm. It represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people who openly avow that there is an unwritten law that justifies them in putting human beings to death without complaint under oath, without trial by jury, without opportunity to make defense, and without right of appeal. Oh, the lynching mania has spread throughout the North and Middle West. It is now no uncommon thing to read of lynchings north of Mason and Dixon's line, and those most responsible for this fashion gleefully point to these instances and assert that the North is no better than the South. The great lion, Frederick Douglass, was still an important and impressive figure at Centuries Inn. On January 9th, 1894, at Washington, D.C.'s historic Metropolitan African, African Methodist Episcopal Church, Douglass delivered the lessons of the hour. In this speech, Douglass rejects the idea that African Americans were to blame for the racial tensions between themselves and whites. He calls out the violence against black Americans in the form of lynching, and he advocates for voting rights. And finally, he calls upon America to eliminate prejudice and to finally, finally live up to her founding principles. Men talk of the Negro problem. There is no Negro problem. The problem is whether the American people have honesty enough, loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their constitution. Recognize the fact that the rights of the humblest citizens are as worthy of protection as are those of the highest, and your problem will be solved. And whatever may be in store for it in the future, whether prosperity or adversity, whether it shall have foes without or foes within, whether there shall be peace or war. Based upon the eternal principles of truth, justice, and humanity, and with no class having any cause of complaint or grievance, your republic will stand and flourish forever. In another year, Douglas would be dead of a massive heart attack at the age of 77. On March 9th, at Wilberforce University, the 27-year-old professor, W.E.B. Du Bois, gave a speech titled, Douglas as Statesman. As an advocate of civil rights, Frederick Douglass placed himself upon the broad basis of humanity. He and we have said that in the treatment which a civilized country accords its citizens, characters and not color should be the sole basis of all differences. In this stand, the best thought of the 19th century in all the world is with us. Du Bois's words were quickly affirmed by the young poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar in his 1897 poem about Frederick Douglass, Battle Cry of Freedom. Douglass kindled a battle cry of freedom. He dared the lightning in the lightning's track and answered thunder with his thunder back. We weep for him, but we have touched his hand and felt the presence of his magic nigh. The current that he sent thy throughout the land, the kindling spirit of his battle cry. Thank you all very much for joining us in this exploration of the works of African-American writers in the 1800s. I hope you enjoyed it. 
in just a minute or two, we are going to get to the Q&A, but I want to take this moment to thank everyone who has been involved in this amazing project. First and foremost, thanks to our phenomenal actors, Jeffrey D. Williams and Chantel Thrash. Thank you so very much for so brilliantly bringing the words of these important writers to life. We're only sorry we couldn't see you, Jeffrey, next time. Thank you to Dr. Griffin for your insight, your scholarship, and your guiding hand on this project and the exhibition coming up. And there are six people behind the scenes who I um, wish could come out and take a bow right now, uh, because without them, there is no Black Literature Matters project. They have conceived and researched and planned and organized and produced these amazing programs. Many, many thanks. Adrian Ingram, New York Society Library trustee. Jenny Lawrence, former New York Society Library trustee. Lynn Carey Maida, New York Society Library trustee. Maria Luisa Manda, events assistant. Barbara Beek, special collections librarian. And Sarah Holliday, head of events. Thank you all so very much. This is the second in our series, uh, exploring the works of African Americans over the centuries. And it will culminate in an exhibition this spring, showcasing rare books and items from our special collections. We're thrilled that Dr. Griffin uh, is co-curator, along with our head of exhibitions, Har Harriet Shapiro. Our next online program uh, will explore the first half of the 20th century, and the date is set for March 25th. So I hope you will mark that on your calendars, uh, follow us on social media, and read our uh, newsletters so that you will not miss that. Like the 1700s program, we have drawn extensively from the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, third edition, and the insights of its editors, Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Valerie A. Smith. And now I am going to hand over the virtual pro podium to Maria Luisa. This is Maria Luisa Monta, events assistant for the New York Society Library. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Ms. Waters, for introducing me. Okay, if everyone's ready, here are our questions. If we want to learn more about the lynching statistics in the slides related to Ida B. Wells, what should we read? Well, there are a number of wonderful things um, about Wells that also include information about lynching in that period. Um, one, I would send you first to her own writing, um, to those pamphlets like Southern Horror um, and Lynch Law. Those were pamphlets that she wrote and published. Um, also, she wrote an autobiography. There are two great biographies of, um, of Ida B. Wells. One is by the historian Mia Bay, and the definitive one is by Paula Giddings. So I would send you to those books about Wells in order to learn more about her, but also to get more information about the um, epidemic of lynching, which she fought. next question for you, Dr. Griffin. It's, I'm curious about, um, so can you talk a little bit about the power white women had over slaves? Certainly, there are a number of um, very interesting books like um, books by uh, uh, Elizabeth Fox, of AC, um, uh, you know, more contemporary historians um, like Kabolia Gink who talk about um, white women as mistresses. Um, and one of the things is that, you know, there's a sense that there was a kind of gender solidarity and certainly the abolitionist movement tried to create gender solidarity amongst white women activists and black women activists to fight for the enslaved. But what the historians have known is that um, white women who were, were of the slave owning class identified more with their class um, than with uh, their gender. And um, 
They owned slaves. Um, sometimes they were just as brutal, if not more so, than, um, than their husbands and their brothers. In fact, a lot of times um, men acquired slaves through marriage. The, the slaves were actually owned by the women. That was the case with George and Martha Washington, for instance. So um, historians, particularly feminist historians, have done really interesting work on the um, role of slave owning white women in that institution, which kind of deromanticizes them and separates them, I think, in ways from the white women abolitionists about whom we know a little bit more. It's Stephanie Jones Rogers, they were her property, an excellent, horrifying account on, on this exact relationship. It was published in 2019. Right. Thank you so much for this. Um, Ms. Waters, I have a question for you. It's, I think people would be interested in this. It's, why do you think the library, our library, the New York Society Library that is, was more inclusive compared to other membership libraries in the 1700s and the 1800s? Well, I mean, this is an excellent question, and I'm not sure that I have the answer to it, um, uh, but I'm happy to try to hazard a few theories. Um, I mean, first, I'm not sure we actually know whether we were more inclusive compared to other membership libraries. For some, we do know this, um, that this is the case, but I'm not sure that that's the case with all of them. Um, but this is an area that um, would be great to have some scholarship in. Um, there are some stories that I think maybe um, might illustrate intent or, or, or feeling about uh, inclusivity. Um, you know, the man who put up the money and founded the library in 1754 got all of the attention, naturally. Um, but from various sources, it's, um, it seems that it was actually the mother of one of the founders, um, a Polly Spratt Alexander, who uh, it seems has ha had first proposed the idea of the library um, at a gathering at her home where um, some of you know her husband and her son and, and some other um, men were at. And it seems the men really liked this idea, um, picked it up, and were off to the races. But it seems like it was her idea. And um, so I think it's very possible that um, having formed the library based on an idea that um, that a woman had that that's why they um, were continued to be included. Um, another thread of a story that you know might be illustrated with the founders intent is you know thinking about inclusivity not in race or gender terms but um, but you know prejudice in in a way um, there was an article in the Mercury about a meeting that was held at the library and we think this article might have been written by Aaron Burr's father actually um, where he talks about the fact that they were trying to um, vote on tr trustees for the library and there was a what he calls a dirty scheme to exclude English Presbyterians oh my god um, but this was a very real apparently concern in these times and um, in any case the, the scheme failed because as he said they were more interested in the fact that who they were voting in as trust trustees could be trusted to find good literature and build a good book collection um, so their knowledge of literature seems to have been a more compelling argument for the subscribers than any um, prejudice against um, you know their because of their religion um, we do know that some of the earliest members were either slaveholders or uh, slaveholders themselves or were merchants who um, very likely profited from the slave trade um, but at the same time one of the founders, William Livingston, who did have slaves, um, did in fact free his slaves um, to prove his commitment in recommending abolition. Um, so in that sense, maybe, you know, actions speak louder than words. Maybe this has an impact on, um, you know, on their intent and their um, interest in, in providing a library for, um, for all, which was initially the intent 
Um, but I hope there are some scholars or researchers out there who, who want to delve into our archives to, to, to make a case for this, to find out, you know, um, you know really um, uh, how we came to accept women and, um, and you know, African-American men in, in the 1800s. I appreciate this because um, I wish I um, I could find it, but one of my earliest library blog posts for the library when I when I just started on literary landmarks was that there was evidence that Frederick Douglass was at the library for these meetings, and there was a con confrontation between the and uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, it was a a very interesting um, article. I wish I, I remember where exactly it was, but um, so I can post it. But thank you so much. This was excellent. Well, I wish we knew for sure that Frederick, whether Frederick Douglass was actually at the library. We we suspect he pro he probably was, but we don't we don't really have um, the you know we don't really have the truth. Yes, it's, so. it's a bit of a legend, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, there's a question on Pauline Elizabeth Hopkins. It was being discussed. So the question is, in terms of using the romantic novel to express racial themes, was there overlap between her romantic works and those of European romantics in terms of the primacy and power of nature? Or are her novels considered romantic as a result of their expression of emotional themes? More the latter than the former, and, and also because um, she uses uh, the kind of also the romance novel um, as a way of elaborating upon um, kind of social and cultural and political themes as well. Thank you. Well, that was, um, I thought, I believe that we can all agree that her work, especially the other voices, are so rich and raw with emotion. That was just, which leads to this question for both of you, is that is there, um, is there a voice that we have not brought to the event that you recommend for us to explore? I think there's so many voices, and, and it's interesting. I, I also would actually have you explore some of the ones who we mentioned and touch upon, but explore them in even greater depth. So for instance, um, Charles Chestnut uh, is most well known for those short stories, um, The Wife of His Youth and The Conjure Woman. But my favorite Charles Chestnut works that I encourage everyone to read, especially at this time, is a book called The Marrow of Tradition. It's one of his novels, and it's a novel that is um, a fictionalized account of the Wilmington, North Carolina coup, where an interracial um, progressive government is overthrown by um, a white supremacist, a group of white supremacists and the establishment of a white supremacist government. Um, and it's got all this intrigue and mystery and um, quote unquote miscegenation, but um, it's it's very um, interesting to read it in this time, and of course, you know, Du Bois's other writings, which we maybe will talk about more in the 20th century. So I would also encourage people to kind of delve into more deeply the writers you mentioned tonight, as well as to think about um, some of the other writers, like you know, Sojourner Truth, uh, it, you know, her um, her famous speeches and oratory, for instance, uh, and, and others. A Woman is one of my favorite speeches by Professor Jonah Truth. I, uh, fantastic. <laughs> Here's a question for the authors, uh, for the actors, my apologies. I wish we can, we, we can question the voices. Um, I think both of you had some past roles as historical figures or worked in projects set in the past. Any antidotes to share? How is this project similar or different? Well, I, um, hi, this is Jeffrey. I'm sorry you guys can't see me, but um, 
obviously um, we're having some technical difficulties about that. Um, yeah, I, um, I think the most recent of projects that I've worked on, which it wasn't very recent, but um, it was the one man show of Thurgood Marshall, although it's not a part of this time period, um, you know, with his activism and his life's work, um, that's probably like the only parallel I can really draw with this experience. But um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. Um, thank you for the researchers. <laughs> um, and um, I'll just add like hi, like hi everyone. Um, in the past I've uh, played, I think uh, Harriet Tubman, um, before and also um, I was in a piece uh, called Composing Blind Tom Wiggins, which was about Blind Tom Wiggins, if you don't know it, he was like a virtuoso, like blind, um, and he could, was just a genius on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very interesting story that was told with that. And I, I mean, I just have to say that I really love um, playing historical figures just because, uh, and also like ones that are lesser known, uh, just because we get an opportunity to um, kind of share what it was like for them, you know, uh, in a given time in that specific slice of life. And so that, uh, I really have enjoyed this whole process and this journey of here. And I've learned about people that I didn't know about and and just to be able to uh, witness those slices of life uh, as well um, have been uh, truly uh, uh, amazing in this. And so I, again, I, I agree with Jeff, like thank you to all the researchers because it's just really some wonderful information uh, that's been included in both of these presentations. Both of you, your performances were stunning. You truly brought them back to life. So thank you so much. Here's the final question. Ms. Waters, can you say a few words about the library's commitment to the Black community and to combating systematic racism in addition to these programs and upcoming exhibit? exhibit? Um, sure. Well, I mean, Obviously, if you mentioned, I think, you know, this series of programs in particular speak very loudly of our commitment and our interest in exploring, you know, the, the hidden history of our library, you know, and the contributions of African Americans and people of color in the literary canon itself. Um, we're trying to highlight that in our book collections um, uh, as well, you know, um, aggressively promoting our book collection, both existing and, and newly published works that are coming into the collection that deal with themes of um, systemic racism and police brutality um, and those that are written by people of color. Um, you know, it's important for all of us to recognize um, that the story of an institution as old as ours is, you know, 267 years, has historically been written about and recounted through a white lens. And I think that the events of the last year, um, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others, they've provided us with a, an imperative for many of us to, to really investigate our part um, in promoting, you know, rather incomplete and frankly unfair versions of history. And we're trying to address that. We're trying to investigate that. Um, and frankly, it's exciting for us to look into our archives and our history and, and discover things that um, we didn't know. Um, and that's what we do as librarians and archivists. It's, 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 um, it's a wonderful rediscovery um, you know, to bring this to the surface. Um, you know, in general, we're trying to look to be more inclusive and welcoming to anyone who wants to join the library. You know, the problem is, of course, 
the word society in our name, the location on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and this funny library that charges a fee. What is this? You know, that often gives people pause. Um, but we are, in fact, open to the public. Um, we want everybody to know that, and um, it's up to us to keep trying harder to get that message out. And um, we hope all of you who have attended this program um, will s help spread the word and help us and, um, and, um, and help us look into our archives as well. Um, we're, we're committed to it. Everyone for answering the questions and thank you so much for the registrants who attended i we hope to have you again for our next programs